Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to five player game, Blueprints of Mad King Ludwig, designed by Ted Alsbach and published by Bezier Games, who helped sponsor this video. The king is looking for architects able to suit the whimsy of his desires, but the best castle won't necessarily be the best designed one at least not according to traditional expectations. Are you prepared to get creative and appease the king's unusual demands? If so, join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, find and shuffle the room cards, which have this back, and deal a number of them into a deck based on your number of players as shown in the rulebook and here on screen. In this video, we'll assume we have three players dealing 50 cards, returning the rest back to the box. From the cards you kept, deal a number of them face up, equal to your number of players, plus two, so five in this three-player game. And these cards are in what is known as the market. These are the king's favor tokens, which you mix face down, revealing four of them in a central area and returning the rest to the box. Then nearby, also set the included colored pencils and sharpener. Each player now collects one of these sketch panels, a sketch and score sheet from the related pads, and a double-sided reference card. Just be aware, for this video, I'm gonna keep my score sheet on the pad for easier writing. Every player now inserts their sketch sheet into the corners of their sketch panel like this. These are the bonus cards, which you shuffle into a face-down deck, dealing two face-down to each player. You can examine your own bonus cards, but keep them a secret from the other players. Then choose a random start player and give them the castle eraser. The cards with this back are the royal decrees. Shuffle and deal two more than the number of players face down into a pile, returning the rest back to the box. Give these to the players seated to the right of the start player. They'll privately examine the decrees and pick one to keep, putting it face down in front of themselves and passing the rest to their right. That player will examine and pick one, passing the rest, and so on, until eventually the start player receives the remaining three to make their selection. The leftovers are returned to the box, and then the players all reveal the decrees they chose, keeping them face up in front of themselves. As we'll learn, during the game, you'll be adding rooms to your sketch sheet, and the rooms come in a variety of types, indicated by their different colors as shown on your player reference. Beginning with the start player and going clockwise around the table, each person picks any one of these room types and colors in the foyer on their sheet with that color. However, just be aware the moat and the courtyard are not considered rooms, so you can't pick those. I'm going to pick orange, which is known as a utility room, and fill my foyer in with that color. You then fill in the leftmost swan found here on your score sheet, and I'm gonna use orange again, but the color you use to fill in swans doesn't really matter. Why you might pick a certain color for your foyer and the purpose of the swan we'll learn as we go, but otherwise, that's the setup. In Blueprints of Mad King Ludwig, you and the other players will be claiming rooms from the market to draw on your sketch sheet as you create a wondrous and perhaps peculiar castle to satisfy the various whims of the king, represented by a variety of ways you can score points, which we'll learn about during this video. Have the most points by the end of the game, and you win. The game is played over a series of 10 rounds, and during the first round, turns are taken beginning with the start player and going clockwise once around the table. And when it's a player's turn, they first collect a card from the market. To do this, pick any of the ones displayed in the market and take it along with the colored pencil matching its color, so red in this case. You must now add the room you collected to your blueprint by sketching it into a valid space there. Each room card has a size based on this value and a type based on its symbol and color here. Red are known as activity rooms, and the same room will be shown in two different ways, with one being a flipped version of the other. Every room also has a certain number of entrances represented by these notches in its walls. When adding a room to your sketch, you must align one of its entrances to one already sketched on your sheet. At the start of the game, this means it must connect to your foyer. Now you can draw the rooms freehand if you like, using the faint grid on the card as a guide for how it must fit onto the marked grid on your sheet. But be aware, you can also rotate the room to any 90 degree angle and use either version of it in your final drawing. 
If you're not as confident you'll draw it correctly, you can lift a corner up from the sheet and slide it under since it's a transparent material, and then you can just trace the room with your colored pencil. Just remember, you must connect at least one entrance on your new room to one already on your blueprint. Perhaps something like this. As you draw, make sure you include all of the entrances. And when your outline is complete, make sure you fill in the room with its color. And be aware, you can never draw a room so that it overlaps with any part of something you previously drew. In person, I find the markings very clear, but to ensure extra clarity during this video, any rooms I draw and color in, I'll also outline in pen to make it even easier for you to follow along. At the start of the game, although you have this full sketch sheet, your blueprint can only have rooms drawn within this initial dashed outlined 9x9 nine nine grid known as your lot. So if I was drawing this room later, I couldn't place it this way, even though these entrances attach, because this room extends past the edge of my initial lot. I also couldn't put it over here, let's say, like this, because now the room is actually leaving the sheet entirely. I could, however, perhaps place it this way, because now I have entrances that are connected and the room is fully within my lot. And it's okay that the entrance down here would be blocked by the border of the sheet, which brings up another important rule. Although a new room must have at least one of its entrances connect to another entrance in play, none of its other ones need to connect to anything. And it's even okay if you end up blocking others in the process. So let's say I placed this room here so that these two entrances connect it. This entrance here on the bottom of the room is being blocked by the border, and its wall here is blocking this entrance of the foyer. That's okay. The main thing to ensure is that you stay within your lot and that your new room has at least one entrance connection. Along with sketching your chosen room, be sure to check to see if it has a swan symbol in the area here, because not all rooms have one. If it does, then fill in the leftmost empty swan of your score sheet here. And again, we'll see the value of the swans a little later. Now I should say up front, there's a few other things that can happen during your turn, and we'll discuss them. But during a very basic turn, you claim a card from the market, sketch it on your sheet, and fill in a swan if it had that icon. Then set your sketched card into a face-down pile beside yourself. It will show the value that was on the other side and any swan icon that it had. This value we'll discuss in a moment, but as you add new rooms to your blueprint later, also add their cards to this pile. And I'll just point out the spaces here at the top of your sheet are for your name, the date, your final score, and the name you give to your architectural masterpiece. So on a turn, you take a card from the market, draw it, and place it face down in front of yourself. Then the next player, in clockwise order, takes their turn until everyone has gone once. However, the last player in the turn order gets a bonus. In addition to taking a turn as normal, they also fill in the leftmost empty circle to the right of this go last area. As we'll learn, filling in circles can unlock bonuses for use during your turn. And once a player has filled in all six of these go last circles, they don't fill in any more, even if they would end up going last again. Either way, once everyone has taken a turn, the current round ends. Any leftover market cards are now discarded into a reserve pile next to the room deck. And then a new market is created by revealing two more rooms than the number of players, so five again in this three-player game. You'll know the game is over when you don't have any cards left to refill the market when you would need to. As I mentioned, during the very first round, turns are taken clockwise, starting with the player holding the start player eraser. But in all future rounds, turn order is handled differently. From the second round onward, players look at the size value showing on the topmost card of their room pile, and then turns are taken going from the player with the smallest value all the way up to the highest. So during the second round, this player would go first, then this player, and then the player here. Let's say after the second round, these cards were now on the tops of players' piles. This player has the lowest value and would go first, but here we have tied players. If there's a tie, the tied players break the tie by comparing the next cards 
under their pile. So here, between these two players, this player would go second, since they have the lowest value here, and then this player would go. If there was still a tie, you'd check the next card down, and so on. If players run out of cards to check in their piles while trying to break a tie, those players use the initial clockwise order from the first round to break their tie. So other than the first round, in all future rounds, players use the values on the top of their piles to determine the turn order they'll collect and sketch rooms onto their blueprints. And don't forget, the player who will be last in the turn order fills in the next available go last circle on their score sheet. This is something the last player records as soon as the turn order for the round has been determined. Here's something else to keep in mind. When it's your turn, you can choose to skip it. You won't collect a card from the market or do anything else that round. Instead, the first time you skip a turn, fill in the circle above this skip turn box on your score sheet. The color you use doesn't matter, and this will unlock a benefit that you can use later, as we'll see. You might choose to skip if the rooms in the market won't help you or if they won't fit properly. If there's no card you can take and sketch onto your blueprint, then you must skip your turn. And so you might end up skipping your turn more than once during the game, but you only get to fill in the skip turn space on your scoring sheet once. All right, so those are the basics of a turn, but what exactly are we trying to accomplish when we're drawing these rooms? One objective is to complete rooms. During your turn, after sketching a room onto your blueprint, you must check to see if any of your rooms are now complete. And to help explain the rules for this and many other situations, I'll be drawing various different examples, so don't be surprised if my blueprints change quite a bit from one moment to the next. A room is complete if all of its entrances are connected to other entrances. For example, our foyer here has an unconnected entrance, so it's not complete. This blue room has a connection at this entrance, but its other one is blocked by a wall, and that doesn't count as a connection, which leaves this room incomplete. If a door touches the border of your lot or leads to an empty space, even one outside your lot, those are also incomplete connections. Let's say we had just gained this room and drew it here. We can see that all of the entrances to this red room now connect to other entrances, so this room is complete. Not only that, this room we just added also has all of its entrances connected as well. After completing any number of rooms on your turn, find the matching colored rows on your score sheet and fill in their leftmost circles. We completed a red and a gray room, so we fill in a circle here and one here. Which colored pencil you use doesn't really matter. At the end of the game, you'll earn the points showing here on the right multiplied by how many circles you filled in from that row. But that's not all. A filled in circle also gives you access to the reward that type of room provides, which you can use during your current turn or save for later. When you want to use a room's reward, fill in the flag showing above it and then resolve its effect shown here, which is described in more detail on the matching row of your player aid. Filling in the flag reminds you that you've used up the related reward. To use it again, you'd need to complete another room of its color in order to fill in the next circle, making its flag available for use. With that in mind, let's go through each of the reward types and see how they work, starting with sleeping rooms. These are the blue rooms, and when you use one of their rewards, it allows you to change the location of entrances showing on a new room you're about to sketch. For example, if I was about to sketch this vineyard and activated this reward, I might move this entrance over to here, and maybe this one here. Or I might just move one of them. The only thing you can't do is change how many entrances the room has. You also can't move entrances to walls that are slanted, or curved like we see here. So when relocating either of these entrances, or both of them, I could put them along this wall, this one here, here, and this one right here. But again, not here, because this is slanted, cutting through a square. With that understood, let's now learn the reward from purple rooms. These are known as living rooms, 
And when you use one of their rewards that you've gained, pick any unconnected entrance currently in your blueprint and remove it. Remember, it must be an unconnected entrance. So we couldn't remove this one, but maybe we choose this one. To remove an entrance, fill in its notch with its room's color. Once an entrance is removed like this, you no longer have to consider it when checking to see if the room is complete. So in this case, that means removing this entrance just completed this red room because its other entrances are all connected. We now get to fill in a circle on the red row, gaining its reward to be able to use. Speaking of which, let's learn how these red activity room effects work. Here, you fill in a red flag before taking a room card from the market on your turn. And then instead of collecting one from the market, go through all of the cards in the reserve, the ones that were discarded at the end of each round, and pick any one of those to take and add to your blueprint instead. This is especially helpful if there are no rooms in the market you want, and just know players can look through the reserve at any time. With that understood, let's learn the yellow room effect next. Yellow are known as food rooms, and unlike other rewards you gain, which can be resolved at a later time if you like, you must fill in the flag above a yellow room reward as soon as you gain it and resolve its benefit during that round. The benefit of a yellow room? You gain an extra turn at the end of the current round. So after everyone has had their initial turn of the round, you would then go again claiming another card from the market, drawing it on your blueprint, and adding it to your face down pile. Now if more than one player has an extra turn to resolve during the same round, those players resolve their extra turns in the same order they took their initial turns during that round. If a player has earned more than one extra turn during the same round, they get to take all of them, but each player must have a chance to take their first extra turn before any player can take their second extra turn, and so on. Keep in mind, there are a limited number of cards in the market, so it's possible that when you go to take your extra turn, there won't be any cards left here to claim. But don't forget, if you happen to have a red room reward that you could use, you might choose to resolve it during an extra turn because it would allow you to take a card from the reserve. In this way, you can combine any rewards you've collected. For example, if I had a red room reward, I could collect a card from the reserve and then also use a blue reward to move its doors around as I draw it. Now that said, when you have an extra turn to take, if there are no cards for you to claim in the market and you don't have a way of getting one from the reserve, you'd be forced to skip that extra turn. And don't forget, the first time you skip a turn during the game, even if it's an extra turn, you fill in this reward circle. After that, any turns you skip don't provide you an additional reward. One other quick reminder, we know that the go last reward is given to the player who will go last when the turn order is first established at the start of a round. If another player ends up going last because they gained an extra turn, they don't fill in a go last circle for that change in the turn order. With that understood, let's move on to the green room reward. These are known as outdoor rooms. When you decide to resolve one of their rewards, it allows you to expand the size of your lot. Just pick any one of the green dashed lines and color in its flag. For the rest of the game, you ignore that line when sketching rooms. For example, I could fill in this flag here, which allows me to ignore this line, and that means all of these squares here are now available for me to fill rooms into. I won't be able to go past this area because, of course, these lines here are still in effect. Only once I fill in more of these flags will I be able to expand my lot even further. All right, now let's learn about the orange room rewards. When you decide to claim this reward, draw two bonus cards from the deck to secretly examine and place with any other bonus cards you already have. These will come into play during final scoring, so we'll discuss the value of bonus cards then. Just know, if the bonus deck runs out, you can't resolve utility rewards anymore. You still fill in its circles as you complete their rooms, you just can't use their flags. Okay, next let's learn the moat reward. And this one is different from the other rewards because you don't earn it by completing rooms. There are no moat rooms in the deck. 
Instead, after you've filled in the fourth swan on your score sheet, also fill in the circle here. During that turn or a later one, you can claim this reward by filling in the flag and adding a moat to your lot. A moat is a straight row or column of single squares drawn as long as you like anywhere within empty spaces of your lot. I've already started drawing one here, and I'll just finish it off by doing this. You then fill it in with the moat color, which is this one here. Now, we'll see that during final scoring, moats can help you score some points, but they have another benefit. Any entrance that touches your moat now or later is immediately removed. This can be a way to complete several rooms at once, and then you'd immediately get to fill in their related circles. In this case, I'd fill in one for blue and one for yellow. After you fill the next four swans in on your score sheet, you gain another moat reward that you can add to your blueprint when you like. Any swans you gain after that point have no effect. And remember, like all rewards other than food rooms, you can resolve a moat reward as soon as it's earned or save it to resolve during one of your future turns. And also don't forget a reminder of all the rewards for each room type and moats are right here on your player aid. Now before covering the last type of room, known as downstairs, I want to talk about courtyards. These aren't really a type of room. Instead, courtyards are any empty spaces within your lot that are fully enclosed by lines you've drawn from rooms and moats and that have at least one entrance leading into them. For example, this area is fully enclosed, but it doesn't have an entrance going into it, so it's not a courtyard. This area has an entrance, but it's not fully surrounded by lines you've drawn. The edges of your lot or the page don't count. This area is enclosed and it has an entrance. So this is a courtyard and the size of the courtyard doesn't matter. This small space here is also a courtyard because it's fully enclosed and has an entrance. As we'll see, you score 10 points for each of your courtyards at the end of the game. But with that, it's time to discuss the final type of room downstairs. These are the gray rooms and they have special sketching rules. The very first downstairs room you draw can connect to any entrance of your castle, just like any other room. But once you have a downstairs on your blueprint, every other downstairs room you draw must connect to at least one of your other downstairs rooms. So if I was drawing this one next, it would have to connect to this entrance. If you can't connect a new downstairs to a previous downstairs, then you're not allowed to take that card. You can, of course, add any other type of room to a downstairs as well, but if you have no more downstairs entrances available, you won't be able to add more downstairs rooms to your blueprint. Like any other room, when you complete a downstairs room, you gain one of its rewards, which, when resolved, allows you to add a secret door, also known as a secret passage, to any room in your blueprint. To sketch a secret passage, choose any wall, in any room that isn't curved or on a slant and sketch the outline of an entrance and then draw another entrance connected to it like this and then fill in both. This is a secret passage. As you can see, it's okay if it leads into an empty space, but it can't extend outside of your lot or go into a moat. Just be aware, you can also draw a secret passage directly over an entrance already in a wall. And when you do this, that entrance is considered removed. Or if it helps thematically, you can think of it as being connected. So in this case, that means this room is now complete and we fill in a green circle on its reward row. If you have a secret passage leading into an empty space, you may sketch a new room connected to it, but it must connect to an entrance on the newly drawn room. Secret passages are a handy way to create a courtyard too. For example, if we drew one right here, it will create a courtyard out of this space. And remember, secret passages are always considered connected, no matter where they lead. So adding one to this already complete room keeps it complete, it doesn't become suddenly incomplete. That said, secret passages can help you complete a room you might not otherwise think you'd be able to. 
This blue room here has two entrances. One is connected to our foyer, and this one is blocked by the wall of this red room, so it would seem like we'll never be able to complete this room. However, with a secret passage reward, we could draw a secret passage around this entrance and run it into this room, which now creates a secret passage between them. This completes the blue room and we would gain its reward. Just be aware, you can never create a secret passage that crosses through only solid walls. In other words, I couldn't put one right here. It can cross through one solid wall, but the other side of the secret passage must either go into an empty space or into another room's entrance. And with that, we've covered all the various room rewards. However, there are two other rewards we need to consider. Remember, you have these reward circles along this top row of your score sheet. The first one is automatically filled in. This one you fill in the first time you skip a turn, and these you fill in each time you're last in the turn order for a round. Fill in the first three, and you gain access to this reward flag. Fill in the next three as well, and you gain access to this flag. These are known as special rewards, and as soon as you have any, you can use them at any time during your turn. Each special reward can be used in one of two possible ways, and when you fill in its flag, you decide which one. One option is to just fill in the next swan on your moat track. The other option is to use a special reward to instead claim the reward of any room type you choose. You don't fill in one of that room's circles. Instead, pick a room type and fill its color into the flag, resolving its room reward right away. For example, I could fill this one in gray and create a secret passage. Or I might instead choose yellow, filling this in to immediately gain an extra turn that round. The box for each special reward is only used if you choose to fill the flag in with orange and take the utility room bonus. The box below it is then filled in at the end of the game, so we'll see how that works when we get to final scoring. If you use any other reward benefit, you ignore the box area. All right, with that, we now know all the options you have when taking a turn. Don't forget, during a round, each player takes a turn, and then any unclaimed cards in the market are put into the reserve, and a new market is created for the next round, with players taking turns going from the lowest to highest value showing on the tops of the piles in front of them. When the room deck runs out, you finish the final 10th round, and the game ends. At that point, if anyone still has room completion or special rewards they want to use, they can do so now, but they must resolve them in the same turn order followed during the 10th round. Once all players are finished, it's time to calculate the final scores. You'll find the steps for this and all the rest of the game right here on this other side of your player aid, but let's go through the scoring together. First, multiply the number of circles you filled in on the yellow row by the point value shown here. It doesn't matter whether you filled in the flags, only the circles. So here it would be 4 times 1 for 4. On the blue row, we filled in 2 circles, so that's 2 times 5 for 10, and again 2 times 6 in this case for 12, 1 times 7, and 1 times 8. The green row is scored differently. Each filled-in circle represents an outdoor room you completed, and each completed outdoor room can score you some points which go in the box beneath it. Now to help with this, I like to number each of these circles. Then I number each completed outdoor room on my blueprint in the same way. So let's score the one labeled 1 first. An outdoor room gives you 2 points for every adjacent fully empty space, and 1 point for every partially empty adjacent space. So this outdoor room scores me two points here, one point here, one point here, another two here, one point here, this is a full two points, and this here is one point, for a total of ten points. I record that value into this box here, and then calculate the scores for my other completed outdoor rooms the same way, adding their values to any of those boxes. You then take the total and put it right here. Each moat you have can also score you points. When scoring a moat, imagine yourself standing at any one outside edge of the board looking towards your blueprint in the related direction. 
For every room fully behind the length of the moat, from that perspective, you'll score two points. So if I chose to stand here and look in this direction, I would include these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rooms. I wouldn't include this room because it's only partially behind the moat. Same with this one here. And these ones here are fully outside of it. Now, that said, if I was to look from this direction, then these one, two rooms would be fully behind the moat. So I'd probably choose this direction where I'm gonna score seven rooms times two points for a total of 14 points. You record your first moat score here, and if you had a second moat, you'd score it the same way, but you can pick a different direction to score it from than you did for your first moat. Either way, when scoring your utility row, check how many circles you filled, and for each, pick a different bonus card in your hand to score. Bonus cards have a variety of ways you can earn points from your blueprint. For example, this one gives you five points for each of your living rooms, whether they're completed or not. We won't go through each bonus card as how they work is printed on them, but if you have any questions while playing, you can refer to these pages of the rulebook. It doesn't matter how many bonus cards you're holding, you'll only score as many of them as your completed utility rooms and you only have to decide which ones you're going to score at the end of the game. And you record their related points into their related boxes. You now also check the flags you filled in on this top row. Any you placed an orange flag into are an additional bonus card you can score, and you place its score into the related box, then total it over here. No scores go into these boxes, they're only used if their flags are filled in with orange. Next, you earn 10 points for every courtyard you created, adding that total right here. You then go through the pile of room cards you collected over the course of the game and total the values in their corners here. I've already done this and it came out to a total of 50, which you record into this space of your score sheet. Next, check your Royal Decree card. This was assigned during the setup, and some of these will provide you with a special benefit only you'll have during the game. For example, with this decree, anytime you gain an extra turn, you take it right away, rather than waiting until the end of the round. However, some will provide you with additional points at the end of the game. For example, this one earns you 12 victory points for every pair of completed red and purple rooms in your lot. You'll find every decree described here in the rulebook if you have any questions while playing. If yours provides you with points, record them here. This box is for a special variant we'll discuss later, so ignore it for now, placing the total value of this row into this space. Finally, check each of the king's favor tokens that were placed during the setup, and for each one, you'll gain a number of points based on your rank relative to the other players. For example, this one checks to see which player has the most courtyards. That player earns 15 points and records it in one of these boxes. The player with the second most courtyards would earn eight points and so on. Now, in order to qualify for any of these points, you must have at least one of the required element in your blueprint. For example, a player with no courtyards wouldn't score any points for this token. If two or more players tie for a rank, Total the points for all the ranks those players would have taken up if they hadn't been tied, and divide them evenly rounding down. As an example, let's say in a four-player game, someone was clearly in first place for a token. They'd earn 15 points. Then let's say the next two players were tied for the second place rank. They would total the second and third rank scores, eight and four for a total of 12, and divide them evenly, earning six points each. The player in last place would then earn the one point of the fourth place rank. Score each king's favor token, putting your scores in each of these boxes as required, and their grand total in this box. Then total all the scores along this column, putting the grand total here, and the player with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, the tied player with the highest total among the cards in their room pile wins, and you'll also find that recorded here on your score sheet. If there's still a tie, the tied player with the most points from the king's favor tokens wins. If there's still a tie, the tied player with the most filled in circles from completed rooms wins. If there's still a tie, 
Seriously? You still have a tie. Okay. The tied player who filled in the fewest of their flags wins. And if there's still a tie... First of all, I don't believe you. But if there is, the tied players race to see who can grab the eraser first and whoever does, wins. Try not to hurt yourselves. The game also comes with rules for solo play and a double decree variant for any player count where players will have two royal decrees during the game instead of just one. But those rules I'll leave for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Blueprints of Mad King Ludwig. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.